Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog Yukon King as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Say, what's easier than falling off a log? Here's what's easier. It's fixing yourself up with the swellest tasting breakfast ever. Simply take a big red and blue package of Quaker Puff rice or Quaker Puff wheat. Pour out a crisp, fresh bowlful of delicious rice or wheat shot from guns. Yes, these premium king-size grains are shot from guns. Exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. Bigger and better tasting. Now topped with fresh canned or stewed fruit and milk or cream. And say, do you know what you've got? You've got a breakfast treat that can't be beat. That's Quaker Puff Rice or Quaker Puff Wheat. The Major and Mike traveled as passengers on the Northwest Trading Company's freight sleds from Skagway to Dawson. And when they reached the Klondike boomtown, they took rooms at the Palace Hotel. The Major was delighted to be back in his old stamping grounds, but Mike was unable to share his enthusiasm. Ah, oh, we're here at last, Mike. Yeah. In Dawson, the heart of the gold country. From what I can make out of this town, you can't find any gold here. All you can do is spend it. <laughs> That's quite true, my boy, quite true. But the creeks are close at hand. When do we start for them? Oh, all in due time. We shall relax for a few days, Michael. And enjoy the spectacle of Dawson. There's not a penny to waste on enjoying the spectacle of Dawson. Uh, uh, We've got to buy an outfit and a dog team. You persuaded me to come up here with you, Major. But the idea was to hunt for gold, not to have a good time. To have a good time, one only has to take advantage of one's opportunities. I can enjoy myself wherever I am. Then you can enjoy yourself digging gravel. Uh, How much do we need for supplies? Only $200. And we'll need a dog team and a sled. I shall arrange for them. I've been told that you can't buy a good lead dog for less than 500 Ah, there's where I have a pleasant surprise for you, my boy. A surprise? And pleasant? <laughs> it doesn't sound like you, Major. I've learned to be wary of your surprise. But this is different. Ah, yes. Now... What would you say, my boy, if I told you we already own the lead dog? I'd say the wish was father to the thought, and that your imagination had overcome your good sense once more. Not in this case. No, no, indeed. We own what is probably the best lead dog in the Yukon. Always accepting Sergeant Preston's king, of course. And who's he? The best in the business. You'll see him before we leave, Dawson. But Blackie is a magnificent specimen as well. Is Blackie our dog? Yes, he is. And how did we happen to acquire him? I have owned him since he was a puppy, my boy. He was only ten months old when I left the Yukon two years ago. By now, he's achieved his full growth. But is he trained? Should be. I left him in the care of a trainer named Kurt Crandall. Not an admirable character, Michael, but with a reputation for efficiency when it comes to dogs. Did you pay this, Crandall? hundred dollars. More than enough to cover training and board for the two years I've been gone. Yes, Blackie should be a veteran of the trail by now. Well, let's find out about that. This Crandall may have sold him, thinking you weren't coming back. Ha! Impossible! I've written him, you see. Let's find out. Very well, my boy. But uh, Dawson has changed so much that I'm not sure where he lives. Uh, The best idea would be to inquire at, uh, shall we say, the Monte Carlo. We can inquire there, and that's all. Uh, 
Yes. Come along, Michael. The Major and Mike left the palace and walked down the main street of Dawson to the Monte Carlo Cafe. The place was crowded with newcomers and miners from the creeks. And the Major headed straight for the bar. Ah, there's my old friend Tex, still presiding over the beverages. Ah, hello, Tex. Hello, Major. Welcome back to Dawson. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I think we would like... We'd like to find out where Kurt Crandall is. Yeah, yeah. Kurt Crandall? <laughs> Why, well, he's sitting right over there in the corner, Major. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Come on. Uh, mm, thank you, Tex. I'll be seeing you later. Well, I'm glad you're back, Major. Oh, really, Mike. For the sake of old times. For the sake of new times, let's find out about this dog. We shall. That's Kurt sitting alone, the one with the black beard. He looks to be an ugly customer. Oh, well, we can't all be handsome. Hello, Kurt. Major. Yes, after two years, I've come back. Oh, uh, this is Mike O'Day. How do you do? Hi. I've come back to claim my property. How is Blackie? You still got an appetite? Excellent. In fact, you owe me 50 bucks. Oh, think nothing of it. You're going to pay me, eh? You don't get the dog. I shall pay you, of course. What's $50? Oh, what's $50? Here. And since you choose to be unfriendly... I shall relieve you of your charge at once. You take us to the kennels, please. <laughs> I don't mind doing that at all. Let's go. The kennels were on the outskirts of town. There were a number of huskies and other breeds in the runs, and the dogs barked furiously as the men passed. Kurt led the way to a run at the end. There was only one dog in this one. His coat was black, and he huddled in a far corner. There's your blackie. Yeah, but what's the matter with him? He's healthy enough, if that's what you mean. Here, blackie. Here, boy. As the major called, the dog sprang to his feet. It was true that he was a magnificent specimen, but his eyes were filled with hate. He snarled his defiance, and then he ran the length of the enclosure and hurled himself at the wire barrier. Get back, major. It's all right, he can't break out. He didn't catch you, did he? No. And that's our lead dog. <laughs> what have you done to him, Crandall? He was a decent, sweet-tempered puppy when I left him with you. You've turned him into a wild beast. The wolf strain was always in him. Came out when I tried to break him to harness. You must have brought it out, sir. There's some dogs that you can't break. This one's a killer. No, no dog is a killer unless he's made one. I won't argue about it. He belongs to you, not me, and I'm glad of it. Now, do you want me to put a bullet through him, or do you still want to take him with you? What do you mean, take him with us? Let him out of there and he'll kill us all. Get back, you moron. I can get a muzzle on him. You can lead him with a stout chain. He's no good to anybody, Major. You better have him shot. Nonsense. You're not going to take him with us. Oh, no, not at once. I'm leaving him here, Kurt. I want him well fed, understand? You're wasting your money. Our money it is. And no mistreatment. I must decide whether I shall sue you for the malicious destruction of my property. Malicious destruction? That's what I said. You've ruined a valuable dog. And I shall make you pay for it in some way, sir. Come along, Michael. It was that same evening that the Major was talking with a group of men in the Monte Carlo. Kurt Crandall entered the cafe and pushed his way through the crowd to his side. What's this you're saying about me, Major? It's nothing I won't say to your face, sir. I believe you should be restrained by law from training, handling, or, or even owning a dog. Why, you've no right to say a thing like that. No? What you've done to Blackie gives me the right. There's nobody could have done any better with a dog than me. He's vicious, he's mean, he's a killer at heart. Why, it's slander to say that I'm not a good dog trainer. You're trying to take away my living. I shall prevent you from mistreating another dog if I have to go to law to do it. Why, if a jury ever got a look at that mutt, they'd be on my side from the start. Nobody could have done any more with him than I did. I can prove you're wrong, You sir. can't. I'm willing to wager that with a proper handling, Blackie can still make a good lead dog. That in the space of two weeks, he can be broken to harness and driven down the main street as part of a team. Ha, 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 ha. I'd like to see the man who can do it. I'm sure that you have. You? I name no names. I'll wager a thousand dollars that it can be done. I'll take that bet. Not you, sir. I'll have no further dealings with you. I've called your bluff. Oh, no, you haven't. But if you are the one to accept my wager, I demand something extra. Uh -huh. Odds, I suppose. Well, I'm willing to Not give odds, you... Not odds, Kurt. In addition to your thousand, you must put up a signed agreement that you will never own, train, or handle another dog if you lose. That's a bet. 
that you'll pay me $10,000 if the agreement is broken. But if I win? Well, you'll win my thousand, then you're free to continue with your business. Agreed. Shake hands, I'll... I will not shake hands with you, sir. Everything will be in writing. Blackie must be driven down the main street of Dawson two weeks from tonight at this same time. Eight o'clock. Tex, yeah. pen and ink and some paper, if you please. All right, Major. The terms of the wager were written out, and both men signed the paper. It was witnessed, and then... Here's my thousand. You hold the stakes, Tex. Here's mine, Tex. Yeah, you sure got a good bet, Kurt. Don't I know it. Major. Major. I just heard you bet a thousand dollars that Blackie can be trained in two weeks' time. <laughs> Quite true, Mike. I've already posted the money. Yeah, and he can't back out of it now. What have you done, man? You've given away all the money we have. No, no, Mike. There's one man who can win my wager for me. Huh? And you and I are going to see him right uh, now. I don't know. It was to the headquarters of the Northwest Mounted that the Major led Mike. And 15 minutes later, they were in Sergeant Preston's office. The great dog king lay at his master's feet and watched the major's face as he described the terms of the wager. I feel strongly about the man, Sergeant. This was the only way I could think of to make him give up his business. He can be fined for cruelty to animals. Oh, not enough to matter. But of course you must win to put him out of business. He's got to win or we're broke. And you're asking me Have to... you seen Blackie, Sergeant? I have, Major. Isn't it a shame what's been done to him? You remember what a fine puppy he was? Yes, I remember they're asking me to train him. You, sir, are the only man with the courage, strength, and skill for the job. What's the use, Major? There's no man equal to it. You'd be risking your life, Sergeant. It's too dangerous. The dog's a killer. I don't believe that, Mike. And I'd like to save him. Then you'll do it? Yes, Major. King and I will do our best. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Man, oh man, seems like one thing you can't be sure of is the weather these days. Boy, I <coughs> uh, If you ask me... You? Hey, I didn't see you come in. Oh? Who are you? Why, I'm the weatherman. Weatherman? Boy, you're the fellow that can tell me. Me? Sure. What's the weather going to be like tomorrow morning? It depends. Huh? Well, what's it going to be like? Sunshiny, rain, snow, or what? Could be... Oh, look, can't you tell me for sure? Young man, speaking off the record, that is, you can be sure of only one thing tomorrow morning. What's that? Rain, snow, or sunshiny day, I say nothing makes a day like a breakfast of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice with milk or cream or, and fruit. Oh, you go for the breakfast cereals of wheat or rice shot from guns. Do I? I eat a big bowl full every morning, winter, fall, spring, or summer. Regardless of the weather, huh? You bet. They help supply food energy the year round. Right. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice furnish extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. And say, here's a tip. If, mind you, I say if, it's real cold tomorrow morning, you might tell the boys and girls to ask Mom to pop their Quaker puff wheat or rice into the oven and heat, just for a jiffy. Good idea. And maybe pour on some hot milk, too, huh? Right. Now, there's a real easy-to-fix, warmer upper breakfast. And delicious, too. Remember, Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice are shot from guns to make them crisp and tender. Yes, these king-size kernels are actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. Ask Mom to get both kinds, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. Now to continue our story. The following morning, the Major and Mike led Blackie from Kurt's home to the force headquarters. The dog was muzzled, and it took the combined strength of the two men to control him. However, when Blackie saw King, his interest was in him and not in the men. And the sergeant had no trouble in leading him to an empty run out in back of the barracks. You're, you're turning him in here? I'm going in with him. King, you stay outside. Come on, Blackie. You better leave the gate open, sergeant. Why? So you can leave fast when you take his chain off. I'm not leaving right away. We have to get acquainted, don't we, Blackie? 
First the leash comes in. As soon as the dog was free of the restraining leash, he turned on the sergeant and jumped for his throat. But the muzzle kept him from slashing with his teeth. Sounds like him. You better get out of there, Sergeant. Blackie leaped again. This time, the sergeant moved fast. He stepped aside and caught the dog in midair. Down, I said. One arm went under the dog's jaws and closed in a vice-like grip. Blackie was unable to move or his wind would be shut off. The sergeant lowered him to the ground. I say down, I mean it. Don't let go of him. If you do, he'll go for you again. That's no way to act when someone wants to make friends with you, Blackie. How about it? Are we going to be friends? All right, I can wait as long as you can. I'm going to hold you until you change your mind. You don't sound nearly as mad as you did. How about it, boy? It's up to you. I'm not going to let you go until you stop that snarling. Here now. No more growling. I'm not going to hit you. I'm just patting you. Good dogs like to be patted, and you'd like to be a good dog, wouldn't you, Blackie? Well, you're going to have a chance anyway. Lie down now. That's it. Just lie quiet. That's the idea. Quiet, boy. Good dog. Sergeant, you're a wonder. Well, you've quieted him down, but I don't know. He's still muzzled, and you're a long way from breaking him to harness. You think there's any chance of doing that? There wouldn't be if I had to turn him alone, but don't forget I have King to help me. Uh, how can he help? You'll see, Mike. We've made a good start. I've proved I'm not afraid of him and that I'm stronger than he is. He respects me, and he may start to like me before long. You're smart, Blackie. Won't take you long to realize how we do things around here. No whips, no beatings. What's more, I'm taking your muzzle off now. There. You'll like it here, Blackie. Wait and see, boy. Blackie might have learned to trust him, but the sergeant was forced to make a trip to 40 Mile. And the first night that he was out of town, Joe Mason, one of Kurt Crandall's few friends in Dawson, sat down at Kurt's table in the Monte Carlo. Evening, Kurt. Hello. I suppose you know who's got the major's dog. I know. I don't blame you for looking so glum. I think you're going to lose your bet. Not a chance. Preston hasn't even tried to put him in harness yet. He still has more than a week to do that. That dog will tear him apart. Uh Uh-huh. I was over at headquarters this afternoon. The sergeant was just starting out for 40 miles. I watched him while he said goodbye to Blackie. Yeah? He was talking to him quietly. Said that as soon as he got back, he'd teach him how to work in Harsnes. He could go along on the next trip. Oh! Hey, you wouldn't have laughed if you'd seen Blackie after the sergeant left. I'm not going to lose my bet, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) Well, personally, I wouldn't like any part of it. Well, I'll see you later, Kurt. Kurt's eyes were hard and his jaw set as he watched Joe walk away. The outward sign of a determination forming in his mind... Dog has to be driven the length of Main Street for the bet to be worth. Joe may be right. The sergeant may be able to handle him. To get a chance, that is. It's up to me to make sure he doesn't. Blackie woke that night shortly after midnight, and he whimpered a little. Something was wrong. The gate of his run was wide open, and then the scent reached him. The man he hated was very near. He raised his head and saw him, leaning over the fence of the run. The man carried a length of heavy chain. Even as Blackie watched him, he swung it. And the link spit deep into Blackie's shoulder. Blackie leaped against the fence. Kurt brought the chain down over the dog's head. The pain was a blinding flash. Blackie turned and ran through the open door of the run, away, on and on, as far as he could get from the man he feared. It was two days later that the sergeant returned from 40 Mile, and the major met him with the news of Blackie's disappearance. This, this is Saturday. There are only seven days more. Blackie may come back before then. Doesn't seem very likely, and the saddest part is that I'm almost sure you'd have been able to bring it off, Sergeant. The saddest part is that we're broke. The sergeant's thinking about the dog. Yes, I'd have liked to make up a little for the treatment he's received. Too bad we couldn't give him a chance, King. <laughs> Six days passed. On the following Saturday, the sergeant was driving down from the creeks toward Dawson, and he stopped at the edge of a thick woods shortly after noon to rest and feed his team. There you are. Go to it, boys. What's the matter with you, King? The great dog was watching the woods. Then suddenly, he broke away from his master's side and disappeared among the trees. The sergeant followed him, wondering. And a hundred feet from the trail, he learned the reason for King's action. King was facing another dog. And the dog was Blackie. Hello, Blackie. Blackie only growled a little as the man patted him. That hand had never hurt him. And the man had fed him several times, many times. 
Blackie had been unable to find anything to eat for two whole days. The man slipped a hand underneath his collar and he started to pull away. But the man was leading him in the direction of food, and the scent was overpowering in its attraction. Yes, hungry, aren't you, fellow? But when Blackie reached the edge of the trees and saw the other dogs, he refused to move a step farther. Too much company for your taste? All right, boy, you can eat right there. Blackie watched the man closely. He returned in a moment and held out a piece of caribou meat. There you are. Blackie wrenched it from his hand. Easy, fella, easy. And wolfed it down. Miraculously, when he had finished, there was another piece being held out to him. This time, he took it more gently. See? You don't have to be in such a hurry. The man held out another piece of meat to him. And another. And still another. The pangs of hunger had disappeared. And Blackie felt a delightful sense of well-being overcome him. The time came when he only sniffed at the meat that the man held out to him and dropped into the snow. He was drowsy. His eyes closed. Sleepy, aren't you? Well, that's good. I think you'll be a little easier to handle that way. Of course, if we're going to drive him back to Dawson, King, it'll be up to you. You think you can make him behave in a few hours? All right. Come on, Blackie. The other dogs were lying at the side of the trail. The man led Blackie to a point about ten feet from the sled. Then he turned him around so that his back was to it. Quickly, the man fastened a piece of leather to the harness he was wearing. Blackie tried to pull away from them, and he felt a heavy weight dragging against him. In a flash, he was wide awake and remembering completely. This had happened to him once before, and when he had tried to get away, the man he hated had beaten him cruelly with a chain. But now there was no man facing him, only the big dog with a silvery coat. And the big dog was ordering him to be silent, to stand still, to stop his frantic efforts to free himself. Blackie went wild with rage, and in spite of the weight dragging at him, he threw himself the big dog. He knew that he had missed his target, and then something hit him, the other dog returning his attack, and he was knocked over sideways and into a snowdrift. He fought to rise, but the other dog was holding him down completely helpless. He refused to give up. He struggled to free himself. This was death. Once the other dog's jaws closed on him, and it would be the end. His strength began to fail, and at last he lay quiet, waiting. But nothing happened. A sharp bark and the big dog leaped aside, allowing him to rise. Blackie staggered to his feet and faced him. He started to growl. The big dog barked sharply and he was silent. He admitted that he had been beaten. And yet, strangely, there was no humility in the admission. Because rising in him was the instinct that man's cruelty had thwarted. The instinct bequeathed to him by his mother and his father. The instinct of the born sled dog. This was his place. This was where he belonged. And when other dogs had lined up behind him and a gray and white dog nipped at his heels, trying to make him move out of his place in the line, he refused to budge. This was his place. The big dog with the silver coat upheld his right to it. Sorry, Tango. King says you'll have to run behind this trip. Go on, Tango. Sure you have everything arranged the way you want it, King? You in the lead and Blackie directly behind you? Well, that suits me. Just a second. I'll get you hitched up. How do you do it, King? Blackie's standing here like a veteran. Must be more than teaching them who's boss. There you are. Who can tell, King? It's a long way, but we still might get to Dawson by 8 o'clock. A moment later, when the sergeant gave the command to start... On, King! On! King leaped forward, and Blackie was caught unaware. He sprawled in the snow, and for a second he tried to swerve aside. But an encouraging bark from King brought him back into line. And in less than 15 minutes, he was running straight and true, throwing his weight against the harness. Dusk was falling, though, and Dawson was miles away. A few minutes before 8 o'clock that evening, the Major and Mike walked into the Monte Carlo and found Kurt standing at the bar. Well, well, look who's here. I didn't think you'd show up at all, Major. You're not going to enjoy watching Tex pay me off, are you? Hey, you have the money, Tex? Yep, it's right here, Major. Well, the first thing you can do is tear that up agreement, I Oh, not so fast. It isn't 8 yet. You expecting Blackie to come on before then? Let's go outside. What for? It seems to me I hear a dog team coming down the street. I do for sure. Come along, everybody. Let's take a look. The crowd that poured out of the cafe recognized King setting the pace for the team that was racing toward them. 
There was no mistaking him, and as the team flashed by the cafe, there was no mistaking the dog that ran directly behind him. It was Blackie. The sergeant drove on to the end of the street and then turned around and came back to the cafe. The men pressed forward to shake his hand. And then they all trooped back into the cafe and cheered the major as Tex paid him off. Now, now don't forget, Kurt. Don't forget what this agreement says. You're through as a dog trainer. Now, let me out. I'd advise you to leave by the back door, Kurt. Lucky's out front. Let me out. <laughs> He's taking your advice, Sergeant. Look at him. He's a crestfallen Kurt if I ever saw one. <laughs> I still can't believe it. You only found Blackie this afternoon, Sergeant. You managed to break him in a matter of hours. That was King's doing, wasn't it, boy? Yeah, you're a wonderful dog, King. Yes, you are. And by putting Mr. Crandall out of business, you saved a lot of other dogs from being mistreated by him. A dog like Blackie needs only a chance. He'll do his work well. He'll be proud and happy to give his best. I think you've proved that tonight, King. <laughs> Yes, boy, with your help, we've put Crandall out of business and given Blackie another chance. I'm happy to say this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's adventure. Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice are never sold in bags or bulk. To get the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns, always buy the big red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. That's your family's guarantee that you're getting the one and only Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. And say, fellas, here's a tip. This week is Boy Scout Week. That means the Boy Scouts are rounding up new recruits. Scouting, you know, means hiking, camping, all kinds of outdoor fun and excitement. Adventure, that's scouting. Visit your neighborhood scout troop or write to your local scout headquarters. Join the Boy Scouts for the time of your life. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case Preston faces death. We were sure that the man called Dirk was trading in stolen goods. To prove it, I posed as an outlaw and tried to join his organization. I was trapped when Dirk learned my true identity. It was one of the most critical and dangerous situations of my career. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Wednesday. For delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>